Welcome everybody to this edition of Wellness Wednesday. This is our eighth episode and we'll be going through Labor Day with this special series that's produced by the Society for Integrative Oncology. So my name is Lee Leibel. I'm your host for the series. I'm delighted to be here. I am very active in the society and I co-chair at the Yoga Special Interest Group. I also have a mind-body practice in New York City at Columbia University Medical Center, working with cancer patients at all stages of care. So the purpose of our Wellness Wednesdays is each, each week we shine the light on a different evidence-based or evidence-informed mind-body practice. And today our light is going to shine onto yoga, meditation, and chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, or CIPN is the acronym. Um, as you know, CIPN is a very difficult and very common side effect of some of the care, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, in particular the taxanes, the platinum compounds, the vinca alkaloids, and also Velcade, which is a targeted therapy. It is, it's difficult to treat and it manifests in many different ways, but especially what we call the, um, they call it the glove and the stocking effect. And it's when you have the tingling, the numbness and pain in the fingers and toes. And this can really affect the quality of life of a cancer survivor, uh, putting them at greater risk for falling and just for functional ability, even uh, perhaps buttoning a blouse would become very difficult or impossible to do. And our experts today will talk more about that. So it, it, it is difficult to treat CIPN and there's lots of research going on in the field. And today we have two researchers who are looking at a somatic yoga based um, intervention or protocol, looking at the feasibility and the efficacy um, of this, this intervention across different um, outcomes and measurements. So I am really excited to introduce our two guests today, our, our panelists. Um, I will begin with Dr. Mary Lou Galantino. Mary Lou, or Dr. Galantino. Um, she is a physical therapist and a researcher and, oh, sorry, my screen has just gone crazy. Um, Sorry about that. So Dr. Galantino is a, uh, a physical therapist, a researcher, and distinguished professor of physical therapy at Stockton University in Galloway, New Jersey. She did her postdoc work at the University of Pennsylvania, and she had a, uh, a fellowship with the National Institutes of Health in Integrative Medicine. She also uh, did a TED talk uh, a few years back that you can find on YouTube. I watched it this morning and it is so inspiring. Um, I would invite you all to watch it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, so Dr. Galantino's clinical interests are evidence-based practice, integrative medicine, chronic pain, HIV and cancer rehabilitation, long-term care rehab and systemic disease. So I welcome you. Um, Dr. Galantina, thank you for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. And Dr. Robin Tiger, I am very pleased to welcome uh, to our, our panel today. Dr. Tiger is a physician and a certified yoga therapist. She's the founder of Yoga Heals for Life. Dr. Tiger's practice specializes in self-care, stress reduction, and cancer recovery. And her focus is on treating the whole individual, mind, body, and spirit. She's also passionate about working with physicians and self-care and burnout. And she's the host of the Physicians Self-Care Community on Facebook. This is a private group for physicians. And if you are a physician um, joining us today, uh, we would welcome you to um, to look on Facebook and join her group. It's really, it's really amazing. And Dr. Tiger is also a member of the Yoga Special Interest Group. 
So uh, welcome, Dr. Tiger. So Thank you. delighted that you're joining us. So our format today, uh, we will go for 30 minutes. I am going to hand this over to the doctors and they have a, a PowerPoint. There's so much information to unpack, but really what we want to do is talk about the research, but also share some self-management tools um, to, uh, to help manage the CIP and the side effects. And we're also going to share the actual intervention for the, from the research project. And we'll, we'll put some information in the chat box with you. So with no further ado, Dr. Galantino, take well, it away. Thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm just pulling up this PowerPoint presentation. If you can, can everyone see this now? Yes. Fantastic. Well, I have the great honor and pleasure to co-present with my co-researcher, friend, and great colleague, uh, Dr. Tiger. And I'm particularly thrilled to have the audience here today that is perhaps a mix of clinicians, researchers, and uh, cancer survivors, and some of you who may indeed be in treatment right now. Uh, the signs and symptoms, as Lee already mentioned, were all of these identifiers, the uh, glove stocking distribution, the tingling or pins and needles, burning or a warm feeling, numbness, weakness, discomfort or pain, and, and in, ad in addition, a temperature sensation alteration. What we know is that um, in the literature and clinically, we see that in some instances, up to 100% have uh, impact from chemotherapy. And this can be quite persistent over the course of several years. And what we know, and I can speak to this in my own personal journey um, as a breast cancer survivor, uh, thriver, I would say, is the journey through this symptom in particular was one of the most challenging elements as a physical therapist. I use my hands and clearly this quality of life was compromised. My independence in being able to autonomously do manual therapy based on pain affected every facet of my life. And it is one of the most humbling places to be, to be the clinician who actually for most of my career has done cancer rehabilitation and then become a patient in my own system. Yet the key feature is the ability to speak about these sensory changes immediately when they emerge. So again, as Lee had mentioned, these functional deficits begin to emerge. Unable to button a sweater, feeling as though your balance isn't quite right. And having this self-report and one simple question, do you have tingling in your hands and your feet, is actually a valid and reliable question that indicates the diagnosis of CIPN. Additional workup through neurology and other clinicians on the team really address reflex and vibration in particular. And you think about vibration and you think, well, why should that be so important? But vibration loss doesn't allow you to feel the subtleties as um, Dr. Tiger will speak about today in the, in the real essence of body awareness. So I wanna encourage um, those who are experiencing symptoms or clinicians who are screening for this to look at sensory loss, any type of weakness in particular, uh, fall, um, risk and also if there are any vacillations in blood pressure because that too can impact quality of walking and impact balance as well. What we know in the literature and you can see that there's been quite a bit um, since uh, 2015 we've been seeing quite a bit of exercise that has certainly been improving the condition of strength and endurance but overall, sensory motor training really can improve balance and help to prevent falls as an actual intervention while navigating living with CIPN. I'm so pleased to present just briefly um, Dr. Greenlee and colleagues. These are from our SIO guidelines that really brings together what the research has shown and bridges this next 
step of why yoga for CIPN. The evidence is compelling and it's exciting to know that meditation, stress management, yoga, massage, and all of these modalities actually improve mood as well as quality of life. The caveat, however, because many individuals do experiment with supplements and various uh, nutraceuticals, that acetyl L-carnitine is actually not recommended to prevent CIPN. So we want to be able to take the large body of evidence and then ask the question, how do we move through in the malintegration of the use of somatic yoga and meditation in the construct of CIPN? Dr. Tiger? Thank you. So as Dr. Galantino just described, um, cancer research has shown that yoga and meditation are beneficial for such things as anxiety and stress reduction, depression and mood disorders, and improving overall quality of life. But what about those individuals who are suffering from the symptoms of CIPN? Next slide. So anecdotally, uh, I have noticed for years and heard for years from so many cancer thrivers that have taken sessions with me, whether they be in group or private, that they have improvement in their symptoms, the numbness, the tingling, the pain, they just feel better. And over and over again, for years, I've heard the same thing. I feel better after I practice my yoga, my meditation. And the more I do it, the more I come, the better I feel. For some, it's a decrease in symptoms. For some, it's the symptoms actually go away. Next slide. And so this is also private sessions, group sessions, whether I'm working in a group or individually, I'm hearing the same thing. Next. And I was really noticing over the years that individuals in sessions improve balance, improve posture, improve flexibility and strength simply from practicing their yoga and their meditation. Next. But to date, there had been no research officially evaluating what I had noticed, what Dr. Galantino had experienced personally, in that the yoga is helpful in some way, shape, or form to individuals who were suffering from these symptoms. Next. And so Dr. Galantino and I were connected by a mutual colleague, Dr. Jen Brooks, who's physical therapist who specializes in oncology and lymphedema therapy. And we came together and collaborated on two research pilot studies to do just that, to evaluate the effectiveness of a yoga meditation protocol for individuals who are suffering from these symptoms. Next. So what we know is that there's decreased proprioception. Proprioception means knowing where your body is in space, and there's decreased sensation. And those two things lead to disembodiment, really not being within the body. And the soma, as described by Thomas Hanna from Hanna Somatics, is defined as the body perceived from within. That's having a first person experience of being in your body. So I created a somatic based yoga and meditation protocol with the intention to increase cognitive awareness and increase extremity reintegration. Next. And Thomas Hanna and Eleanor Criswell, Criswell, both of somatic yoga teach us that it isn't really how much you move. What is important is how you move. And that stretching only temporarily lengthens muscles. And that's because when we stretch a muscle, the muscle then sends a signal to our spinal cord and our spinal cord sends a signal back to our muscle and says, we contract, kind of like a rubber band. Stretch a muscle, stretch a rubber band, it recontracts. And it's staying that those signals are only staying at the spinal cord level. In somatic yoga, to bring that embodiment in, 
we bring the sensation and the movement to the brain. We involve the brain in our movement by focusing on voluntary movement and focusing on sensation. And those two things are called pendiculation and interoception. Next. In pendiculation, um, we are voluntarily contracting muscles and we are voluntarily slowly decontracting muscles. So muscles that are contracted are stuck over time become the new norm. Thomas Hanna coined that as sensory motor amnesia. You can notice that just looking around and look at all these bad postures a lot of us have, right? People have shoulders that are in, they're hunched over, they've got tech neck, right? Everybody's hunched over and that becomes the new norm. So over time, our chronically contracted muscles become what is normal for our bodies because our brain thinks that that's where our muscles should be. So with pendiculation or eccentric contraction, we are voluntarily contracting our muscles, voluntarily eccentrically or slowly releasing that contraction and taking that movement away from the spinal cord and bringing it up to our brains. Next. The second piece that's very important is called interoception. And what that means is we're paying attention on purpose to the sensations within our body with each movement. So it's very possible that you, for example, are doing bicep curls with a dumbbell and you can do 15 of them while you're still making your grocery list, right? You can think about other things while you're moving your muscles, but you're not actually feeling what's going on. And that's actually a disembodied movement, a disembodied thing that's happening. Certainly your muscles getting stronger, but you're not sensing it. The brain is really voluntarily involved. And that's how we don't release sensory motor amnesia. So we combine pandiculation and interoception we can become more embodied. And so this somatic protocol allows for that engagement of the brain, allows for that brain re-education so that the muscles can increase their resting length and become longer naturally, and you can feel more spacious and comfortable in your body. Next. I also use a somatic meditation as part of our protocol. And I chose a meditation that was created by Dr. Richard Miller, which is called I Rest, kind of like the iPhone, little I, big R. And he created this meditation based on his own knowledge as a yoga scholar, as well as a psychologist. And he took traditional yoga nidra, which is thousands of years old, and took out what he thought would not be necessary, what isn't really helpful, and he put in what he thought would be, based on what he was asked to do, which was to create a very safe and effective meditation for the military population at Walter Reed Army Hospital several decades ago to help with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. It's secular, it's evidence-based, and it's trauma-informed. And it's been shown to not only help with release and processing of trauma, but it's been proven so much so to help with chronic pain that the Department of Defense, the Surgeon Army General in 2010, declared this type of meditation a tier one treatment for chronic pain, finding it as equally effective to take in medications, which is pretty amazing. Okay, next. So this is the protocol that we used in our, in our two pilots. And this is a link that Lee placed in the chat if you'd like to look up this study. Um, both of our studies are in the journals. This one is from SIO's journal, in an International Journal of, Yo I'm sorry, the Integ Integrative Cancer Therapies. And the second pilot, which Dr. Galantino will talk about in just a moment, is in the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. And it's in that second pilot where you will find some references to each piece of this protocol so that you can go and help your patients, help your students, help your clients move through what we found to be helpful in our study. In addition to the somatic pieces, I'd like to point out that we focused on parasympathetic response, really drawing in the, the, the upregulation of the parasympathetic nervous system to increase the calm, the relaxation response by choosing breathing practices and mudras, which are hand gestures, in addition to the somatic movements and meditation. 
So thank you, Dr. Tiger. And we've come a long way, baby, because when I did my yoga teacher training and had done previous small pilot studies on other impairments within uh, the uh, cancer rehabilitation framework, typically Hatha yoga was my personal training that I did in 1999. And then learning this deeper, more meaningful somatic component really made a difference in this protocol. And so that's why the emphasis of our presentation is on the protocol itself, because it's here where I briefly present our findings from this intervention. And it was a, these are two small pilot studies that I'm gonna quickly go through. We measured flexibility through sit and reach, the functional reach, which is a test going forward to look at your balance, timed up and go, which is speed of walking, sitting and turning around again, a quality of life questionnaire, as well as looking at pain, per perceived stress, also sleep. We looked at spirituality in the context of this, as well as falls efficacy. We also added some biological markers, which included salivary cortisol, as well as vibration sense that we talked about earlier using the bioesthesiometer. So we have 10 individuals that participated and we actually found that individuals were improving in all aspects of flexibility, balance, and gait speed. And they were all significantly improved. And this is a small pilot study, which we were very excited about. Pain severity and pain interference, pain interference also reduced, as well as the, uh, the neuropathy questionnaire was significantly reduced and stress had also reduced. In addition to that, we actually saw the physiologic changes that Dr. Tiger spoke about with the intentionality of the beauty of this protocol, which was a greater awareness of one's feet and hands emanating from the variable of vibration sense. And we were thrilled to find this and it was significant. We also took um, qualitative findings. We wanted to understand the felt experience. And these five themes emerged where there was this vacillation, almost a waking up of the feet and the hands with yoga. Also this transferability to daily activities, improving in function, a sense of relaxation, and then this group engagement, that camaraderie of knowing that you're not alone living with CIPN. So the great news is that this first study um, really showed that we could improve quality of life, flexibility, and balance. And of those 10 individuals, eight participants were actually at high risk for falls as measured on the forward reach. The great news is that none were at fall risk at the cessation of the intervention. So obviously larger clinical trials are needed. It's a small pilot, but we were really looking at feasibility. And so we then went, that was a two time a week intervention for eight weeks, moved to a one time a week to see, can we move into a multicultural setting at the Leadership Studio in Atlantic City? And could we actually look at dosage? Can one time a week for eight weeks make a difference? And we were excited to see that we had improvement in trends in flexibility and gait speed. Again, fall risk was a wonderful finding. These were more trends. We did see that the symptoms had a significant improvement of quality of life, as well as fear of falling improved. Once, one of the richness um, of doing mixed methods approach is really that capturing of the art of the felt experience. And these similar findings in qualitative reports and journals and discussions and focus groups really had that incredible utility of the mindfulness in all activities throughout the course of the day. Once again, that social, social support really was that additive component and improvement in self-confidence, balance and stability are other domains that we are really excited about, but yet we know that additional research is necessary. Uh, randomized clinical trials are indeed uh, forthcoming here as we look forward. And we really need to appreciate these recruitment challenges, especially in this discussion and the dialogue that is ongoing right now as we navigate the pandemic and looking at health disparities. It requires outreach and trust, 
we really need to look at how do we reach members of our communities that can truly benefit by the integration of somatic yoga and meditation. And so I am very excited to report that uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, um, led by a lead investigator, Dr. Uh, Bao, along with other co-investigators, have embarked on a randomized clinical trial and they had similar improvements to ours. While we don't have a lot of time today to discuss their findings, what I'm very excited about is that similarly, um, these improvements are now generating rich data that this evidence is indeed an opportunity for us to incorporate yoga to treat optimally individuals living with CIPN. So as we wrap up here, because I know that there may be some questions in the audience, um, we really wanna thank our co-authors. I wanna thank forever Jennifer Brooks, Dr. Brooks, who uh, fostered this collaboration. Um, Kim Wilson, Sherry Yang, and of course our yoga instructor, Lena D, um, who really, when you look at um, someone who um, really represents your culture, um, your perspectives, it makes a difference. And so looking at that multicultural receptivity is key. We wanna thank Kathy Whitmore and Ali Nunzi as well at the a Leadership Studio for their open arms to us as we did these investigations. And it really does take a team. And I'm particularly grateful to all of our participants who were really brave enough to join us in the journey. And uh, we just hope and pray that they are continuing these practices in their lives and really endeavor quality of life and survivorship. So thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Dr. Galantino and Dr. Tiger. That was um, really a, a, a terrific presentation. And I'd like to open up to the audience now for questions. Um, since we're on this meeting format, you're welcome to just uh, unmute yourself and just speak right up and, and ask a question. And there's also in the chat box, um, there is a link to the study that Dr. Tiger was talking about. And if you, you go to it, you will find the, um, the actual intervention with, with detail on um, more information, specific information. So uh, questions? Or you can put in the chat box too, if you'd like. I, I think while people are gathering their questions, I'd just like to say, I think what is so interesting about this is the multicultural um, part of the study, because in, in yoga research in general, it's usually with a breast cancer population, and that is usually a Caucasian female. I have a question. This is Jody McLeod. Yes. I'm wondering through high through this pandemic, is this one of the modalities that is successfully delivered via telehealth as well, even in a group setting? Have you experienced that? Yes. Uh, I've been teaching. I moved my in-person classes um, as soon as this hit online. And um, they've now gone international. <laughs> I lead two free uh, sessions, yoga and meditation sessions, safe for anyone on the cancer journey per week. Um, and they, it just keeps growing. So um, absolutely, I, had, I questioned it at first. This is such a new thing. Um, and so did they. And the response is, they love it. And it actually brings them the sense of community that they're seeking. Um, I open them. I open the room before and after. They stay. They come early in chat. They stay after in chat. It's the next best thing to being in person. And um, people are actually saying, "I kind of like this, and I think I want to keep doing this. Are you going to keep doing this even after uh, you go back in the studio?" So, I think the big answer is yes. <laughs> 
And if I may, I would like to also add that, particular to your point, um, the cancer support communities across the United States um, also provide free yoga in addition to other mindful movement meditative interventions such as Tai Chi alongside discussions on nutrition and all of that is free and that has also pivoted uh, to virtual delivery as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just taking a look in the chat. Now we've got a, we've got time for um, another couple of questions and then uh, We'll sign off. So we have, is there any research that yoga can decrease the chances of developing CIPN in a cancer survivor? That's a great question. And I will actually state that we're excited to report that there are clinical trials looking at yoga specific for prostate cancer. And um, what's important is to know that um, many of these studies have targeted various aspects of the side effects from radiation, fatigue, as well as erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, and indeed structured yoga intervention on those domains of measurement um, is associated with significant reduction in fatigue and urinary and sexual dysfunction. Um, however, to date, specific to that population, um, uh, with respect to CIPN, because we had various levels, we had a heterogeneous population, meaning that all different types of cancers uh, joined, like it wasn't just a population, um, a pure po population, as Lee mentioned, regarding um, the majority of studies that are breast cancer oriented, but our study focused on uh, several types of diagnoses um, and individuals receive benefit. So more research certainly needs to be, uh, to done, need to be done in order to answer your question specifically. But given the preliminary data, um, I would say, well, come on in, give it a shot, uh, see your own personal experience. And because the somatic piece is so rich, and that uh, embodiment component takes place, perhaps you too will also experience those same wonderful resolutions. Great. Um, we have a comment from someone at the Smith Center for Healing and Arts in Washington, DC. And she wants to let us know that all of their integrative programs are available online, free to the public. Includes yoga, meditation, arts, create creativity and support groups. So that's the Smith Center in Washington, DC. Thank you for that. Um, one, more, one more question. Um, there are actually a lot of questions in here now. Uh, do we know what's the right dose and frequency of yoga for CIPN? I would love to be able to definitively say that. Um, I can say that in our small pilot studies, we had greater significant findings in the variables that we measured for those that did it twice a week and then also adhered to the home-based program. And Dr. Tiger might want to talk about the individualized home program because I think that was a lovely reinforcer in being able to show that um, by continuing on a daily basis and then translating these into everyday practices, um, can really um, make a difference. And we know just um, by dosage that the right dosage at the right time to address the right diagnosis is really very important. And it's all about one's receptivity to the integration into daily living. So Dr. Tiger, did you want to mention perhaps the home component of the program that could have been a, a feature in that as well? Yeah, sure, certainly. So in both uh, pilots, uh, I created um, home practice for each participant, and that included a short and long recorded yoga practice and a short and long recorded guided meditation. And also, these practices were to be done either on the floor or a chair, so they were accessible to everyone. Just that's really important that um, you didn't have to know anything, there was no experience required. And I, when Dr. Galantino said to me for the first pilot, you know, how long do you want the classes to be? How many times a week should we be doing them? 
in my experience, um, individuals who came to class at least twice a week were really benefiting. That said, it's very, very personal. And only you as an individual know what you're feeling um, as you, you know, go through your practice. For me, I have a daily practice. And I know that I'm not the same person if I don't get up and do my practice. But it's a very, very personal thing. So I don't think that we can create a universal dose of time and number of times a week that, that we should be doing it. But the participants who were doing things at home in between seeing us in person were having greater benefits. Thank you, Dr. Tiger. So uh, I'm going to do one more question. So what I'll what I'll tell everyone, there have been a couple of uh, comments that you're not seeing the links that we put in here to the studies. We will follow up with an email this afternoon and include the studies for you. We're happy to do that. I'm sorry that you can't see the links. Um, last last question. Interesting. Is there a gender difference toward yoga? Can you comment on this? I will, and what is very, very interesting is that we have a study now that is similarly going on at the leadership studio, uh, looking at substance use disorder, and the literature there speaks volumes for a preferential desire for yoga in that population. So females are more likely drawn to um, the use of yoga in their daily um, interventions. Um, so gender-wise, um, in the literature, we do see a predilection more for, towards females, but that is changing rapidly. And I'm very happy about that. Again, because we have ventured out in looking at greater um, receptivity by both multicultural populations as well as um, the male population, transgender populations, to be able to begin to integrate yoga as a universality, not gender-based, uh, but beginning to really infuse it at all levels. And again, as Dr. Tiger spoke to, the art of this is what you take away from it. And that dosage, while we give, as I know in physical therapy, we give three sets of 10, if you're not in your body doing three sets of 10 in an exercise regimen, perhaps it's not going to sustain the strength gains that were made. And so that's the beauty of the somatic yoga meditation protocol that really infuses the essence of owning it. And so we want to see this universality for all. And I'm excited to see more male-based uh, studies in yoga with a much, much greater receptivity. We've seen a major transformation in our classes across, across the board, so thank you. Yeah, and uh, we do have a comment about prostate cancer. Um, are there any studies with yoga and meditation for prostate cancer? Uh, yes. Talking about gender, can you just very quickly in 20 seconds comment on that? Absolutely. Again, these themes, these themes seem to be in the area of fatigue in particular, uh, the er also the area of overall, um, re if, if you've received radiation, the radiation fatigue and radiation fibrosis uh, tends to be um, also reduced. So I think that uh, in 20 seconds or less, there is promising evidence to definitely show the benefit for, of yoga to navigate the symptom output from the side effects and the, card and, and the toxicities of treatment over time. And just Great. also mention Dr. Dean Ornish's work because yoga is a very big piece of his research which has shown the reversal of prostate cancer um, through other factors as well, but that 25% of his, his, his formula includes that stress reduction piece, which is yoga. So that was specifically for people with prostate cancer. Thank you for, thank you for reminding us of that, Dr. Tiger. Yeah, if anyone is interested, you can Google Dr. Ornish and his prostate cancer work. It's very impressive. All right, so um, let's wrap up. I'm sorry I kept you a few minutes um, longer today during your lunch hour. Uh, this recording will be available to you. Uh, to, to take another look at. It is on the YouTube channel for the Society for Integrative Oncology. We will include that link in the email that we send you this afternoon. Also, I don't want to forget, Dr. Tiger has pre-recorded a 20-minute yoga video. And that 
as well is on the YouTube channel, the SIO YouTube channel. And it's beautiful. I, I actually practiced it the other day. So we'll include you all these links. So let me thank our, our guests, Dr. Galantino and Dr. Tiger. We so appreciate your, um, your time and your wisdom. Thank you for being with us. And I thank all of you who have taken time out of your lunch hour to join us today. And thank SIO for, uh, for sponsoring this. Next week for our, uh, our Wellness Wednesday, we will have um, Smitha Malaya from MD Anderson Cancer Center. She will be talking about uh, couples yoga. So taking care of the patient and the caregiver. So it's a family approach. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you all so much and have a beautiful day. Bye-bye. And Lee, we would like to thank you for facilitating you. these Wednesdays. It's, uh, it's the way to stop in the middle of our days and reconnect with each other, remind each other that we're here to support each one of us and that to take a breath in the midst of good nutrition while we're having our lunch. So thank you all so very much. And, and Robin, blessings. Thank you so much for thank doing this you. work. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank Enjoy you your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>